Good morning. For, for those of you who do not know me, I, I'm Tyler Azeltine. I'm one of the pastor elders at Gilbert Bible Church. Um, I'm also a, a get to be a student here at TES. Uh, my wife, Kendall, grew up here in this church, and I got to be a part of Grace for close to 15 years before we left with the church plant back in 2022. We are, I can speak for Kendall and I both, that we are so, so thankful for for you all, for Grace Bible Church, for how you have taught us to shepherd our own hearts, uh, to care for our own household, to care for our ministries. Um, Grace Bible Church has, has been used in, in so many ways in, in our lives, and, and we are so thankful for you guys. Uh, we are so thankful for how you have sent us off to Gilbert Bible Church, how you've supported us and prayed for us. And, and I am so thankful to the Lord to just hear over and over again how he has sustained you as we've been gone um, over the last couple of years. Let's pray together, then we will jump into our lesson this morning. Lord God, we are so thankful that you control all things, Lord, that you rule over all. God, we are so thankful that you are good um, and that your, your loving kindness controls your sovereignty, Lord. Your sovereignty works for our good, the good of all who believe in you. Lord, we do pray that you would reveal yourself to us this morning, Lord, as we rehearse, as we hear, as we look at these truths from your word. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to trust you more, help us to to worship you more and better. God, may we love you more. May we grow to be more obedient to you. Lord, we, we do pray that you would use your word this morning, um, now and, and later on in, in the main service, Lord, to shape us, ca cause us to be more like your son, Lord. We pray that you would be glorified in this, in Christ's name, amen. This morning, I am really excited to make an appeal to you um, to study the attributes of God. You could pick up and, and read a well-written book. Um, you could That could be beneficial. You, you should be reading old, well-thought-out, um, carefully thought-out theologians. But my real appeal to you this morning is to over and over again come back to the Word of God. just to know him more. My, my prayer has been that, that seeking to know God better would never grow old to you. We get to open up this book, um, his words to meet with him. We get to know him and find that we are known by him. It's amazing. We, we get to see his trustworthiness and we should take note of what is true of God. We should worship him by praising what is true of, of him, by trusting him, by submitting, by obeying the one that we find here. Why should we study the attributes of God? Um, A.W. Tozer has a great quote you probably know. He says in the knowledge of the holy, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I, I love that quote. It, is it an overstatement? Is that really the most important thing about me? What comes into my mind when I think about God? In Romans 10, Paul ties salvation to knowing and then believing in God. In John 17, Jesus ties eternal life to knowing God the Father and Jesus whom he sent. In, in both of those passages, knowing him is not simply knowing facts about him. You need, you need to trust in him. You need to be under his authority. You need to be his. But faith is tied to understanding truth. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? Romans 10, 14 says. We should love learning more and more about God's attributes because we want to know him better because we want to trust him more, honor him better. A, a very simple definition of an attribute of God 
that, I, that I'm going to use. When I say an attribute of God this morning, what I mean is something that Scripture says is true or is characteristic of God. Simple definition. Um, this morning we are going to look at one of the central, overarching, I, I think most pervasive truths in Scripture, the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. That means God reigns. He rules over all. God rules over everything. I have a, a couple quotes for you here that just kind of unpack that statement, God rules over all. J.I. Packer says, God's dominion is total. He wills as he chooses and he carries out all that he wills and none can stay his hand or thwart his plans. Bruce Ware says, God is sovereign and in his sovereignty, and his sovereignty is both exhaustive, covering the whole sweep of human history and meticulous. Every detail is planned and regulated. God rules over all. He, he rules, rules over all things, everything. What, what we're going to do with the bulk of our time is, is to ask the question, according to his word, according to God's word here, which, which needs to be our authority, what falls into the category of all? What falls into the category of, of everything? How far does God's rule extend? What does all mean? All can mean different things in different places. And when it comes to the sovereignty, to God's sovereignty, how far does that word all go? Uh, what we'll see, I'm, I'm giving you the answer up front so that you can pass the quiz at the end. When scripture says God rules over all, it means absolutely everything, all the time, without exception. I, I love how Bruce Ware said, God's will is both exhaustive and meticulous. His authority is over history as a whole and all of its details. Uh, this list that we're going to go through, it, it feels like a lot to me. It, it is by no means exhaustive. Um, I do think this is one of the most pervasive truths in Scripture. Um, there is evidence of this truth everywhere. God is in control. And, and there is so much of Scripture that points to this fact. But, but I hope it does help us appreciate the, the breadth and the depth of God's sovereignty. This truth is humbling, and this truth is God-glorifying. I, I hope it helps you grow in your love for it. Uh, for most of the categories on this list, just up front, I'd, I tried to give you examples of God's sovereignty in the Old Testament, examples of Jesus' authority in the New Testament, and examples of how God will exercise similar authority in the future. All of God's word points to this truth. What does God rule over? Um, we'll, we'll start with where he started in his word in the beginning, um, and, and we'll see God rules over his creation. In Genesis 1, God exercised his complete control over all things, that actually were not things when he spoke commands and, and things that did not exist obeyed him. They came into being. Let there be light, he said, and there was light. In Genesis 1.1, we see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is, he created everything without exception. And in case we might have misunderstood in Genesis 1, chapter 2 tells us the heavens and the earth and all of their hosts were completed. God made everything. Everything is under his rule. Uh, Exodus 7 to 10 is listed next for you there. Uh, you know of God's mighty deeds in Egypt. The plagues were displays of God's sovereignty over his creation. Why would he do these things? God uses this display of his rule over creation to lead people to know him. Listen to what he told Israel through Moses. Exodus 6.6 6 says, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens 
of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take for you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Because of this display of God's sovereignty over his creation in rescuing his people, they, Israel, would know their God. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 4, we read, When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. The display of, of God's rule in acts of judgments, signs and wonders would cause Egypt to know that the God of Israel is Yahweh. That, that phrase is, is repeated over and over again. Um, By this, you will know that I am Yahweh. Chapter 7, verse 17 says. Chapter 8, verse 10. That you may know that there is no one like the Lord Yahweh, our God. And then chapter 8, 22, there is a distinction between Israel and Egypt in order that you may know that I, Yahweh, am in the midst of the land. And it goes on and on. God reveals that he is in control of his creation and he receives glory as his people know him, even as the Egyptians come to understand this rule. In Luke 8, we see that Jesus has authority over creation. He rebu rebuked the wind and the waves, and the wind and the waves stopped. Uh, the disciples, some of them pretty familiar with wind and waves, were amazed. They were fearful and amazed, saying, Who then is this that he commanded even the wind and the water, and they obey him? In Revelation, you, you've been seeing... God's authority over the heavens and the earth. And, and as you near the end of your Bible, God's authority over his creation is on full display when this heaven and earth will pass away just because of his presence. Um, and his new heaven and new earth will come and he will continue his rule there. God is sovereign over his creation. He is also sovereign. He rules over his earthly creatures. God has power not just over creation as a whole, not just over simple inanimate things like light and wind and waves, but he also has control over, he also exercises sovereignty over earthly creatures, things with life in them. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Psalm 50. And, and while you're turning there, we're going to talk about Genesis again. In Genesis 2.19, God exercised his control over his earthly creatures. Um, all of the cattle, all of the beasts of the field, all of the birds of the sky, when after he made them, he brought them each to Adam so that Adam could name them. It, it, it's amazing, I think, to think about how many creatures were before Adam on this day. Um, th this exercise of authority might not stand out to you with the backdrop of the rest of creation. Um, but if you have tried to train animals, um, if you have experienced herding cats, or, or if you've ever chased one unruly dog down the street, um, th there is an exercise of, of authority on display here. A similar authority is on display in Genesis 7 as God gives a command to Noah and then animals obey and they come to Noah just as God had commanded Noah. In, in Psalm 50, th this psalm judges Israel in light of God's authority over all of his creation, um, including which includes all earthly creatures. God's authority, his domain is, is proclaimed here. And, and it's interesting. His authority does not remove 
accountability, but it actually necessitates it. His authority does not remove accountability, but it necessitates it. Everything belongs to God. What could you give him? Well, you must give him thanks. You must pay your vows. You must give him honor, he says. Uh, Read with me starting in verse 7. God's word says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. Why? For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves on the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? And then there are these commands. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. Everything is his. He is over everything. So his people must order their lives accordingly. Uh, You cannot give God anything. It is his already. He will never be indebted to you. But in humility, you must submit everything that he has entrusted to you to him. You must submit yourself to him. Offer, pay, call, he commands his people, and he will rescue them. And they will honor him. That, that is gracious. His, his sovereignty, which is displayed in his rule over every creature, is going to be exercised for his people's good. Jesus exercised similar authority over creatures during his earthly ministry, and he will put on display his good authority over them when he establishes his reign upon this earth. Um, God rules over earthly creatures. He also rules over his heavenly creatures. Angels are sent and they obey. They go. They do as God has directed Nehemiah 9.6 says, You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. Revelation 19.10, These spiritual beings who appear worshipable because they are that great, are just fellow servants, fellow slaves of God. They belong to God and they obey God. In Matthew, these angels serve the Son, the Lord Jesus. He rules over his spiritual creatures. He also rules over fallen spiritual creatures. You saw this in Jude a week or two ago and and have seen this in Revelation already. Fallen spiritual creatures exist, and so they are under the sovereign hand of God as well. This is on display in Job 1 and 2. In Yahweh's presence, God himself twice says to Satan, the adversary, Have you considered my servant Job? Um, God hears Satan's requests, and it is God who gives first Job's things into Satan's hand, and then God gives Job himself into Satan's hand. In both scenes, Satan cannot go beyond what the Lord has determined. He is subject to the rule of God. God rules over Satan. Jesus too has authority over fallen spiritual creatures. In Matthew 4, Jesus is led up by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. He listens. He is tempted without sinning in the wilderness. And then he commands Satan, go. And Satan leaves. Luke 4 is one one example of the many times Jesus demonstrates his authority over other fallen spiritual creatures, demons. 
And then Revelation 20 is the culmination of God's command over these creatures. God's rule here will be seen when Satan is bound for a thousand years. And then when he is finally thrown into the lake of fire, where his judgment will be forever and ever. God rules over fallen spiritual creatures and he rules over the nations. Go ahead and and turn to Genesis 11. The nations do not exist because of their own will. Um, They do not exist because they wanted to. People groups were divided by the mighty hand of God. In, In Genesis 11, spreading out, being divided was the last thing that people wanted. Uh, But what what you see here in Genesis 11 is that God's desire is what mattered. In Genesis 11, you can hear the people's desire really clearly in the repetition of the phrase, come, let us, come, let us, come, let us. And then what we see is while man can plan and try, God does as he pleases. He exercises his authority by dispersing the peoples. Look, look down at verse 3. Genesis eleven three. 3. Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. The people had their plans. They had their desires. But what God willed, he did. And he separated the peoples. He divided them into what would become the nations and the peoples on that one day. In Isaiah, we see that nations obey God and are tools in his hand. Those very nations that accomplish God's purpose are accountable to God's judgment for their own sinful thoughts and actions. God's rule is absolute. Nothing is outside of his jurisdiction and All men are fully accountable for their deeds, for their sin and rebellion and wickedness. In Acts 17, Paul describes God's sovereignty over the nations. Um, He made them all with all of their particulars and God had a desire for them. In verse 26, Paul says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Then then he goes on to say in verse 30, God is now commanding that everyone everywhere should repent because he has fixed the day in which he will judge in the world in righteousness. In those few verses, you can hear God's past, present, and future authority over the peoples of this world. Then in Revelation 19, 15, we see how Jesus will finally rule the nations with a rod of iron. God rules over the nations, and he also rules over individuals. God is sovereign over nations, and he is also sovereign over individual people. Go ahead and 
turn to Acts chapter 2. Um, and, and while you're turning there, in the book of Exodus chapter 11, verse 3, there is an example of something we see over and over in Scripture. God controls, he changes the desires and the affections of individuals. Uh, you might be thinking of Pharaoh, and, and that is true. God exercises dominion over Pharaoh's heart multiple times in Exodus without removing accountability for Pharaoh's actions. But in Exodus 11.3, God acts in many individuals as he gives the Israelites favor in the sight of the Egyptian people. He makes Moses greatly esteemed in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. The, the fact that Moses and Israel would be given favor in the sight of the Egyptians is amazing, um, considering the setting. Egyptians are seeing that God is mighty firsthand and in a way that is very costly to them. It has very costly personal implications. Their livelihoods are threatened or taken away right alongside this message from Moses. And yet God gave Israel, God gave Moses favor in the sight of the Egyptians. I, I think that is an impressive display of God's power over the human heart and over human affections. In Isaiah 44, 28, we see that Cyrus in the future from Israel's perspective was going to be a servant of God. He is going to do what God wants him to do. God has demonstrated his authority over individual people, both great and small. Um, and, and we have to read Acts 2 together. Look at verses 22 and 23. Paul, oh, not Paul here. Uh, Peter, in the sermon at Pentecost here says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God has performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. It, it is easy to get excited about God doing great things and his mighty deeds, rescuing people from giants and tyrants. Uh, but what about when sinners get their way? When they do what they desire and people are hurt and hardship is real. Um, we, we could talk about what ifs. We could talk about examples from our own lives. Act, Acts 2 is, is such a helpful reminder for me. The worst that could happen did happen. The worst thing that sinners could possibly plot, they carried out. Jesus, the perfect son of God, was crucified he was nailed to a Roman cross to die as a sinner. Did those sinners plan to crucify Jesus? Of course they did. Uh, we, we see this in the gospel accounts. But as we read Peter's words here, what matters is that God himself planned this. And he sovereignly carried it out by the hands of sinful men. God is sovereign over individual people. God himself planned the crucifixion of Jesus and they nailed him to a cross. And, and here, even in this most horrible act of sinful rebellion aimed at the most innocent one, God in his good rule brought about good. He put on display his own glory and he accomplished his people's salvation. Whatever trial tomorrow brings, uh, regardless of the intentions of sinful man, you can trust in this sovereign one who did not withhold his own son. God rules over everything and he rules over the hardness 
of the hearts of individuals. That's next on the list. This might seem redundant, but, but for my own thinking, it's helpful to spell out um, the particulars positively and negatively. It's possible to treasure a promise and shrink back from a warning. I want to love all of what God says. Exodus 7 through 11 um, is, is one example of this. In Exodus 7, 3, God says that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. And then down through chapter 11, there are 14 references to Pharaoh's heart being hardened or being hard. God hardened his heart and Pharaoh hardened his heart. God in his sovereignty did as he desired and Pharaoh in his stubbornness did as he desired. And he was accountable for his actions. Some may, may argue, I, I know God can exercise his rule over the heart of men. And I see that he did in Exodus in order to accomplish this great salvation for his people. But this isn't something that he does all the time. Sure, surely God respects the individual. God's word shows that he does exercise this authority. He displays this rule during Jesus' earthly ministry, and he continues to display this rule during the age of the church. Listen to John 12, 37 to 40. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted. And I healed them. It isn't on your list, but another passage that shows how his rule, this rule is ongoing is Romans chapter one and the repeated phrase, God gave them over. God gave them over. He gave them over. God is sovereign over the hearts of sinful men. And that does not remove accountability for sin. Thankfully, his rule doesn't end there. Um, he also rules over his people's salvation. God wants his people to know that his favor, his grace, is not based upon anything outside of his will. When, when God passed by Moses on the mountain, he declared, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Do you hear God's sovereignty on display here? No one influences him. He does as he wills and shows compassion because he desires to, because he is gracious. Isaiah 43 says that God is the one who will save Israel. He alone will save his people. Listen to Isaiah 43, 11 and 12. I even I am Yahweh, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and caused it to be heard. This is something that distinguishes God from anyone else. It is a ministry that he shares with no other. The salvation of his people. He is the author and the agent of his people's salvation. Your comfort, your faith must be in him. In Ephesians 1 and 2, um, just, just listen to these phrases. You, you could turn there if you want, but I, I'm going to jump down through phrases pretty quickly. Notice how many times God himself is the planner. God himself is the actor in salvation and how we believers benefit from his sovereign grace towards us. He blessed us. He chose us. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, 
according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. He made known according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Salvation is all about what God has done for us, for his people. And this description of salvation goes on and on and on to God's glory, to the praise of his glory. In chapter two, it's spelled out from the other angle that we did not deserve to be saved. And we could not do anything to be saved. Believers, we were dead in our transgressions and sin. But God, verse 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. How how could he possibly show us more kindness than he already has? He will. Why? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves either. It is the gift of God. God is sovereign in salvation. Salvation from the wrath we deserve to the favor that we don't. It is all from God. And his rule does not end there. He rules over his people's lives. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Over and over, God is referred to by his people as Lord, Master. Those who have been saved by him are under his authority, under his lordship. We must obey, and now we want to obey. Believers now can obey. Believers get to live in accordance with with the lordship that God already possesses over all things. They get to be under his lordship to bring him glory through their living. I I love Titus 2, 11 and 12, uh, which informs how, how we think about God's grace. For the grace of God has appeared. Praise the Lord. It has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. He gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. God's grace, his his undeserved favor has appeared, bringing salvation and instructing. If you really love God's grace, you love that it appeared bringing salvation. And you should love that it appeared bringing instruction. God rules over the lives of his people. And he rules over circumstances. Genesis 50 has a a pretty extreme example of, of circumstances being under God's sovereign control. After Joseph's brothers tear his clothes off and toss him in a pit while they plotted to kill him, they decide that they would rather take, make money by selling him into slavery and then deceive their father by saying he had been eaten by a wild beast. Joseph, in, in the rearview mirror, is able to say in Genesis fifty nineteen to his brothers, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? God is the one who judges is the implication right there. 
As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. God is sovereign over circumstances, even what men mean for evil. Even that evil, the the Lord turns for good. Isaiah 45 verses 5 through 7 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. God is sovereign over circumstances. The favorite saying of Matthew and the other gospel accounts is, this was to fulfill. God's word, Jesus' words were fulfilled down to minute, literal details. The preparation his coming, his birthplace, his childhood, his ministry, his triumphal entry, his rejection, men casting lots and not breaking any bones, not allowing his Holy One to see decay, but raising him up. It was all fulfilled. Acts thirteen twenty nine says, when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. All that was planned was accomplished. And so you can believe that all that he has declared about the future will be accomplished as well. God is faithful and he will continue to display his authority over every particular circumstance in the lives of his people. So trust him. Choose to honor him with today. Lastly, God rules over all things. Okay, some might say, we know God could control anything. He could and he has stepped in and and moved the hearts of men. He could and he has controlled nature and events and circumstances. But that is different from saying that he always does exercise his sovereignty. Psalm Psalm 103, verse 19 says, Yahweh has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 115 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory, because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He does it. Psalm 135 says, For, now, for I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deeps. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain, who brings forth the wind from his treasuries. He smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. Isaiah 46.10 says, God's rule is over all things. Um, And this is put on display in how he planned the end from the beginning and how he does all that he has planned. Starting in verse 8 there in, in Isaiah 46, we read, Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning 
and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. And, and then a, a favorite verse, Romans 8, 26 through 30. Um, the context here is we don't even know how to pray as, as we ought, but God rules over all and still causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren and those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. His rule over all is impressive. But, but it is amazing that his rule would be applied so graciously to sinners like us who trust in him. Uh, for the good of a rebellious people who have only trusted in him. That is amazing. God's grace is amazing. Spurgeon says, there, there is no attribute more comforting to his children than that of God's sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions that sovereignty overrules them, and that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing for which the children ought more earnestly to contend than the doctrine of their master over all creation, the kingship of God over all the works of his own hands, the throne of God and his right to sit upon that throne. This, there, there are many many implications of God's rule. Um, we'll think through just a couple of them with the last of our time. Um, human accountability and responsibility. Um, if God is sovereign and he is over all that happens, if everything is working towards God's glory, how could I be guilty of sin? one might ask. Wasn't sin the instrument of glory? Ro Romans 6 asks and answers that question. God is sovereign, and so he is the judge. He is the, a good judge. God is glorified by giving grace to the sinner, and he is glorified by opposing the proud, by righting wrong. If that is a, a question... That, that you struggle with, go to Romans 6 and, and, and look at that. Evangelism. Why should we evangelize if God is sovereign over salvation, some might ask? Well, the, I think the answer is because he is sovereign, we can and we must share the gospel. How could men be saved if he was not sovereign? Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. The unbeliever is in a desperate, hopeless place apart from God. But God has chosen to save sinners who believe, and he's actually let us participate in this. The disciples, the church, were commanded to go, therefore, making disciples. Um, and we were promised that people from every tribe and nation and tongue and family would be worshiping Christ in heaven. Every family would be blessed. We can evangelize because God rules over all. We must Share the gospel because God rules over all. Prayer. 
If he is sovereign, why would we pray? You can pray because the sovereign one cares and desires to hear your prayer and to provide for your every need. He has, he has prescribed prayer and he has chosen to use prayer. So pray because the, the God who can do whatever he pleases desires your prayer and he desires to sustain you, believer. When, when God gives you good things, rejoice. When, when his sovereignty lets you see a sunset or hug, hug a loved one or enjoy a good meal or, or take another breath or laugh at a silly dad joke, the good God who made the heavens and the earth gives good things. Honor him in how you respond to those things. And hard is a reality in this life. Sorrow, pain, death. These are what we find in life under the sun. Remember that God has not abdicated his throne. He isn't taking the day off. He isn't sleeping. He knows your sorrows. Jesus is very well acquainted with grief and sorrow and pain. Remember truth. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Do you hear his sovereignty on display in that passage? But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Romans 8 tells us, whatever it is, leads his people to his glory through our conformity to him. Whatever the trial. J.C. Ryle said, there is no commentary that opens up the Bible so much as sickness and sorrow. Um, that th- Those are our reality in this life. And God is still on his throne ruling with a good and gracious hand. Past, present, future circumstances, all of these are under the authority, under the rule of our Lord. We should seek to be faithful with today and trust him with whatever it brings. We can choose to not be anxious about tomorrow. God knows what you need before you ask him. And he desires you to ask him. He desires you to seek him in prayer. He, he will provide what you need to be pleasing to him. He desires us to seek his kingdom and to seek his righteousness under this good rule. Uh, let's pray together. Lord God, I I pray that these words that we read together from your word, that they would humble us, Lord, that they would cause us to fix our eyes not upon ourselves or, or what we can do or what we have planned, but to fix our eyes upon you. Lord, you are overall. And God, we are so, so thankful that you rule with such a gracious hand. Lord, that you give good to your people um, who deserve nothing but your judgment. Lord, I, I pray that you would use truth from your word today even to soften hearts, to draw to yourself, to, to sanctify. God, may your people look more like your son And may you be glorified as as we seek to honor you with this day that you have. Lord, prepare our hearts even now to hear from your word again. Um, God, may you be worshiped. May you be glorified in Christ's name. Amen.